Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our NASM webinar on core exercise progressions. I am Wendy Batts, and I am joined here today by my partner in crime, Dr. Marty Miller. Um, so, Marty, thanks for being here. Um, my pleasure. Thank you, Wendy. We, of course, have Greg in, our, in the background. He is our producer. He will be taking any questions that you have throughout our webinar, so please feel free to write them in, and uh, we'll keep note of them. And at the end, we will be sure to answer all, if not most, of the questions that come through. So let's go ahead and get started. So our first, um, well, we want, I guess I should stop and say that we decided that we were going to do um, the core again. Marty and I did a risk versus reward webinar a couple weeks ago on the core, and we had a, a bunch of wonderful follow-up questions that we actually wanted to take and bring into another webinar for you guys today. Um, some of the questions were uh, just wanting more information on progressions of, of core exercises, what we do in the club, how do we we kind of switch it up and keep it within the phases of training. And uh, we just want to kind of talk to you on how we make it happen with our clients and offer any, um, any kind of advice that we can give. So let's just do a quick review on the core. So remember when we're talking about the core, we're talking about pretty much everything that attaches to the spine. So cervical spine, thoracic spine, and lumbar spine. Um, there's approximately 29 muscles that make up the core musculature. And of course, when we refer to some of the exercises, we're going to think of them as progressions. So things from stabilization, strength, and power. And if you look on our beautiful little picture, this image, this image always kind of freaks me out a little bit, by the way, <laughs> it's this weird, weird anatomy guy. But, um, but when you think about it, when you're thinking about the local stabilization system, all we're really talking about is uh, the muscles that help us with inner vertebral stability. So the little muscles that connect or connect this, the uh, vertebrae, uh, just one small muscle that connects to another vertebrae all the way down. So the, the muscles that people can't see, but are super, super important to help protect our spine through movement. Um, those are the muscles that we focus on in stabilization. So when we're talking about core stabilization exercises, we're really thinking about the ones that involve little to no spinal motion. Um, so things like planks and bridges and bird dogs, those are some good examples. And again, we're going to provide you with some throughout the webinar. Um, and then when we talk about strength, and so strength, again, would be more of your global stabilization system. So now we're talking about the muscles that actually move the spine. So your back extensions, your crunches, those types of exercises. And then again, when we talk about power, we're talking about the movement system. So when we're thinking about the movement system, it's, it's a crunch with a med ball throw, things that really are going to allow us to be explosive in our movement. Um, and before I move on, Marty, is there anything on the review part you wanted to, uh, to, to say before, like based on your feedback? No, I think you did an excellent job. And the, and the reason we're coming back to this is, you know, when we put together the first core uh, webinar, we knew that we were going to just kind of hit a couple of the key points. And it was great and exciting for people to give the feedback. And, you know, the core is such an, obviously such an important part of the body. And more and more attention has been driven to core training. And every one of our clients is going to need a very extensive progressive core routine regardless of their goals. Everything, all human movement starts at the spine and the core. So it's just so important, regardless of their goals, to make sure that they have a, a really well operating core system. And you know, just going back to when you were to talking about the different parts of the core, I remember, you know, how I'd have to explain to my clients when they wanted either the six pack, which we talked about last week that you're not going to get that from core training or you know they wanted to do core training to prevent back injuries and I wasn't having them do crunches and extensions right away you know kind of going back to those stories of you know getting people to just really be able to get their spine in the right position work those little muscles and what I'd always say to my clients is we're going to start training a lot of muscles that you don't know that of, so that way we can get to the muscles that you know the names of and just really making sure we set the foundation, uh, I guess no pun intended, on why we were doing a systematic core progression and total body training, of course. But so many people want to rush right in there and do the crunches and the twists and all the cool, fun, sexy things that they think, but really get them to make sure that they're stable first before we go into those other types of training. Absolutely. And then that brings us actually to our next point. You know, you need to be creative in your programming. And so oftentimes, and actually this was some of the feedback um, or, or questions that I got um, after our, our last 
webinar and it was basically like, how do you do different things in your workout, but still stay within the right phases of training? And so the answer to that is, again, think about, and that brings us to the next point, is what's the end goal and what's the purpose of the exercise that you're trying to accomplish? Where is your client in the spectrum of the phases, the levels of, of training, and you do that based on the assessment? And so, so again, I hope that you're going to get a ton out of this, uh, this webinar. And please, please, please feel free to you know type questions into us because we want to make sure... Before we move on to something else that we really do cover all the questions that that we um, we had gotten before but we know are probably still out there so next up we are going to have Greg switch it over here we're going to talk about some corrective strategies now Marty and I spent a ton of time on this slide because there's <laughs> so many <laughs> there's so many different directions we could have taken this and so um, when we're thinking about, when we talk about corrective strategies, we're going to go into how this can really um, integrate well into our corrective exercise, um, you know, programming. So when we're talking about, you know, CES type work, um, we're going to spend some time on the, the latter part of this slide. But Marty started talking about breathing mechanics, and that's super, super important. And uh, Marty, do you want to go ahead and talk about our little image and, and what all that sure. means? Yeah, so Wendy and I are doing some research here. Uh, when we put this together is we did confirm that that is called a billow. So that's, uh, you know, because I'm a visual guy. So in uh, when I was, Wendy and I were talking about it, I was like, remember that? And, you know, it gave us that visualization. So first and foremost, what I found, and I've worked with every type of client uh, that you can imagine from youth to senior citizens to elite athletes, almost all my clients didn't know how to breathe properly while they were doing exercises. And they would use the muscle that really is in control of your breathing, your diaphragm, to stabilize the spine. And that is a sign of a faulty movement pattern, which means either for whatever reason, they are not stabilizing their spine with the muscles that are intended. They're bringing in their diaphragm, which obviously we want them to be able to breathe. But clearly that's a, a red flag of I need help stabilizing my spine potentially. So let me just use any muscle I know how to control. So when we look at the breathing techniques, and again, I'm just going to give you the breathing techniques, and you'll find times to put this into your programming as applicable, and we can you know, go over some of the real-life examples. But if I get right into planks and bridging, and all of a sudden I'm not controlling my breathing, then that's creating a faulty movement pattern as well, right? I'm, I'm using the wrong muscles to do uh, a, a, an objective that other muscles are supposed to do. So just to kind of get everyone on the same page, when we're looking at proper breathing, and many of you know this, that as I would want oxygen coming in and I take that deep breath, my stomach should actually move away from my spine or enlarge because that's going to open up like you would see the billows as you're taking those two points away from each other. That compartment is going to draw the air in. And then when I exhale, my belly button would be coming into my spine and I'd be exhaling. Now, during this entire time, I should be able to be in a neutral spine position, not lose that. And I should be able to breathe like this in neutral spine, regardless whether I'm doing a plank, regardless whether I'm doing side plank or bridges or bird dogs or a heavy chest press, right? You might brace during that component, but we need to teach these breathing techniques very early on. And I work with, um, in, in my other situation, I work with a lot of high endurance athletes and it's amazing how much they work on their breathing while they're running and swimming and rowing. And so it's so important to establish this, especially if you're working with clientele that are maybe deconditioned, they would have no idea about there is a breathing technique. They're like, what do you mean? I'm breathing. Air's coming in. It's going out. So don't, you know, don't bypass this and assume that when you get somebody that's newer to stabilization training, that this is going to be automatic to them, regardless of their current fitness level. Getting people to have that proper breathing technique where then when they bring the air in, you see their stomach move out slightly. And then when they exhale, they should be drawing in slightly just to make sure they're always in neutral and they would always have their transverse dominus fired. But just talking about how we're going to get through that efficiently and you'd be stunned how a simple bridge, all of a sudden you have them focus on their bridging, all of a sudden their technique goes south on the bridge. So again, we got to build this in into simple movements so that way it becomes second nature and then they can do this while they're doing more advanced movements. 
And Marnie, I'm glad that you, you know, kind of brought that up and went through the right way of doing it, because I'll tell you this, for a lot of years, I was doing it the the wrong way. And a lot of times, like if if um, any of you guys that ever cheered or danced or stuff like that out there, they always wanted you to maintain the most skinniest position that you could um, when you're out there, you know, in competition and everything. And so unfortunately, it would really require me to kind of feel like I'm sucking in my stomach the whole time. And I became a chest breather, which was a very, very horrible, horrible habit to break. Um, and it was hard for me personally. So, um, you know, really kind of look at your, your mechanics and, and do what Marty was saying. See if you can stick your stomach out there and get used to it. Cause it was very difficult for me for a really long time to, to breathe the right mm-hmm. way as, as, as crazy as that sounds. Um, But, you know, taking all of that into consideration and then as Marty was just saying, you know, um, you know, thinking about the five kinetic chain checkpoints and really thinking about the core, you know, oftentimes we hear uh, information about people coming to us with low back pain. So, again, just for some of the basic stats that you hear, approximately 80 percent of individuals will experience low back pain at some point in their life. Um, And you're only as strong as your weakest link. So, um, again, what we're trying to do in all of phase one um, and then looking at just core in general is we really are trying to build a strong foundation. Um, Again, you know, with the activation coming directly from from the core first into uh, our our major muscles, you want to think that we want to get those to fire correctly. So therefore, we directly and we we reduce the chances of these um, as long, you know, as well as many other injuries. And uh, Marty, do you want to comment any more on that? No, I just think the key thing is that early on, you know, one of the things I always say about fitness and training people is, you know, obviously we got to make it safe. And then I always say, give them what they want while you give them what they need. I always spend a ton of time on breathing techniques, postural control, you know, the intervertebral stability that Wendy was talking about. I don't bore them with the science behind it, but really putting in a lot of focus on form and technique regardless of the exercise, as we'll say, everything's a core exercise and it's always about posture because every time we're doing that, I'm reinforcing the proper firing patterns and my body has a better chance of controlling those why we do than lunges and jumps and pushes and pulls, et cetera. So, you know, you guys have heard me say that accidental exercise, but it's just so important to reinforce that structural integrity because we're really looking for long-term fitness and, you know, we can move quickly through progressions and load people, but if you don't have that structural integrity of your five kinetic chain checkpoints, you know, we, we could get into so many different things that aren't geared for this topic, but you're not going to see the results. So it's just uh, an essential part of my training. Yes. And then uh, we're going to discuss a little bit of activation exercises. So those of you guys that have taken the CES or have listened to Marty and I's uh, webinars in the past, we spent a lot of time talking about corrective exercise. And um, you're, you're going to notice that, that Marty and I both do corrective exercises on the front end of every phase of training that we do because it really is extremely important. And we wanted to bring this into play because, again, as a reminder, you know, the purpose of the core um, and the purpose of activation exercises is to, are, are to get muscles firing correctly before you really start to do more dynamic movements. And um, and so when we take two steps back and you think about activation exercises, and if you've been a part of our CES or if you're thinking about it, under the activation section, so again, you know, we're talking about inhibit first, which is foam rolling, then lengthen, which is to, to do static stretching. Then we activate the muscles that are usually allowing those compensations. And if you look through the textbook or if you've, you know, watched some of our webinars, you're going to notice that a lot of those activation or majority of them are very core, core specific um, phase one type exercises. And uh, Marty, do you want to kind of go into to the reasons and rationales of why? Yeah, the core is so important because that's where all human movement should begin. There's a lot of research out there throughout the years that shows what the firing patterns are of people who have low back pain. So the central nervous system works on a feed forward system. So in a healthy spine, my body should anticipate me moving my limbs or or any other part of my body. And it should know to stabilize the spine. So think of that rigid platform you'd want to jump off of or push off of, right? I always, the term I always like to say is you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. So if, you know, having that rigid spine, you know, stable spine, I should say, allows all this other motion effectively. So the research has shown that people that have low back pain, they fire the other muscles prior or way before their core would stabilize. So it should be the core stabilizes, then I move 
my body around it, but the research has shown the complete opposite. So that thing, going back to just the fundamentals of science, I know the majority of people I'm a face in train, I should say, have faced those issues. So that's why it's always going to be back to going through our assessments, finding out what their movement compensations are, stabilizing the core the proper way through those techniques, and then building into their fitness goals through the model based off that stable core. Great. And then it brings us to our last point. And I actually read this in an email following our webinar. And someone asked about uh, how they should really integrate their their core training into workouts for their clients. And uh, my response back, and Marty, you've said this many a time, is basically every exercise that's out there can be or has some component of a core exercise. So don't think of the core being like a separate part. Really think about it as an integrated solution throughout your entire programming process. And I think you're going to see that we're going to show you some examples like, hey, just because we're not focusing on the floor, doing a crunch, doing a plank, it's still very core specific. And that's why another reason we wanted to, to bring that, this up. And uh, before we move on, on into some of the exercises, Marty, was there any other thing you wanted to say about that as well? No, I think, you, you know, you nailed the absolutely perfect. And the one thing I would say is I'm a big fan of doing core off the ground. Doesn't mean I want some core on the ground, especially, you know, my planks and bridges. But when you were talking about crunches, you know, very few times. Now, I did mixed martial arts. So sometimes in that situation, you have to forcefully flex yourself up against resistance but the majority of the time I'm going to be using my core in real life is when I'm standing up against gravity and I'm absorbing force or producing force, picking things up. So, again, I love to do – there's a, a time and a place, especially for stability, to be on the floor. But I always try eventually to get back up and face gravity. And there's a lot of other core programs out there that have some great elements to it. But if all of your core training is on the ground with your spine – stable or, you know, maybe not always facing gravity with your hips and everything else, uh, you know, there's going to be some weaknesses in the program at some point. So think about that progression too, of getting people starting on the ground. And then can you now then challenge them, you know, not, you know, maybe with their uh, body on the ground for different reasons. And, you know, it just changes, you know, how the core has to activate. Absolutely. All right, well then let's move on. So one of the first um, areas we wanted to talk about um, were, were planks. And you know we mentioned planks, we talk about planks all the time because they really are a great, great exercise. Um, usually we would do planks in a phase one type of program because again, we're looking to look for little to no spinal motion of the spine. But again, when you know people look through the NASM text or they go on and they're like, I don't know what core exercises are that I can do that fit that, you know, the beginning of the workout after they foam roll. Well, the thing is, is there's different variations of just this one exercise alone. We could spend a, like forever talking about just planks. And some of my favorites that I do, um, and Marty, I know you have yours as well, is um, I have clients, once they can hold a plank, because again, Remember, when, when people start a plank, they all automatically will start, like, get down in a plank position and hold that for 30 seconds. And to me, most people can't do that or they can't do it correctly if you're really focusing on maintaining proper alignment and drawing in and squeezing your glutes. So challenge number one is if you are new to this, can you or your client perform a proper plank and come up, squeeze your glutes, draw in, and make sure that you're nice and flat, Hold that three to five seconds, completely relax to the ground and do it again and do it again and do that for 12 to 20 reps. People are spent usually if you do that correctly. And again, you want to look at what's happening at the shoulder complex. Are their shoulders level? Because sometimes you're going to see winging, meaning that they really need to add that plus position. And that plus position will allow a flat back and it's totally separate than spinal flexion. We don't want bend in the spine. We want it to be flat. And once your client or yourself can really dial that in and you can do 12 to 20 reps on and off, on and off, you're forcing your core to activate, let go, activate, let go. You're teaching it how to fire when you need it to fire. And then, and then at that point, add the time. And so then decrease the amounts and add more time to each one. Once you have that nailed and you know that you, you own that, then that's when you can start adding some of these fun variations. And I like to do the picture um, where you're going to see like A, B, and C, you know, you start in a plank position, then you'll put one palm down and you end up in a high plank. 
and then you drop back down and then you walk back up and you drop back down. I call those plank walks um, because you're walking up with your left arm first and then your right arm um, for a certain amount or you can alternate. It just depends. But can you do that while maintaining the integrity of your hips and the rest of the five kinetic chain checkpoints? It's so fun. It's hard. It's kind of a cardio workout because you're adding a lot of up downs and and uh, you know motion with your hands. So so it's super challenging. And you can do this again on your knees and then add to that as well. So it's all about variation. And um, another one I'll talk about, and then Marty, I'll hand it over to you. Is like you're going to see the ball rollouts. You can do a plank with hands on top of a ball. Or you can do what this individual on the bottom left is doing, which she's on her knees. You can definitely be on your toes because she's in a regressed position. But she would start in a plank position, roll out, and then bring it back in. Again, you know, it's challenging. You need to make sure that your client has good lat extensibility to do that without compensation. So it is very challenging done correctly. But you know, don't always feel like you have to do the same thing. And these are all phase one exercises. Everything that you see right here is technically a phase one exercise. More advanced, but phase one. Awesome. No, yeah, no, I know, Wendy, you did so much great information there. And I'm glad you talked about, you know, shorter duration on the planks because so many people go right to, oh, I did a 45 second, a minute, two minute plank. It's like, mm, did you really? Like, did you really control your breathing? Did all your five connect chain checkpoints stand there or did you just not hit the ground? So, you know, because we want that true structural integrity. But, you know, as you were talking about that, you know, we were prepping for this. I didn't mention this, so I'm just kind of throwing this in here now is. I've had to regress a plank so much because of the breathing and other things to where I have them do it standing against the wall as an isometric, because there's no way that they're going to be able to not want to look up. They're not going to be able to control their spine. I know they can't control their breathing. They're not going to be pushing into the ground and making sure the scapula in the right position. So sometimes depending on the length of their arms and, you know, you may have to put a foam roller or maybe two yoga blocks there, but just teaching them really to be able to apply force forward which would be upward once you're on the ground and be able to keep everything in line and you'd be stunned how much people feel that you know so again we're showing something that's more like out of scale one to ten some people think that's the beginning plank that's a, a progressive plank when you're facing full gravity so you know get creative i've done plank type of exercises where they're just using a very light band and they walk away from it and again it's because that's all they can control at this point in time so, and then for me, a, a thing that I love to do is, you know, add in that accidental exercise or get more bang for my buck, the very lightest, the yellow uh, mini bands, I'll get into my plank and go into external rotation slightly as I'm in right position and really pushing into the ground, make sure my scapula, you know, in my uh, serratus anterior activated and get a little external rotation because one of my movement compensations is my left shoulder. I am limited in some external rotation. So when I do that with the mini band, and still I'm in neutral, but I'm applying force into external rotation of the band. What a difference that changes for me. And I have to focus on, wait, Marty, control your breathing. Because all of a sudden, that little bit of an extra challenge, I felt myself want to like, you know, uh, guard with my diaphragm. So just these little tweaks can really change the outcome of the entire exercise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then, I mean, and Marty, we talked about this also earlier. I mean, guys, when you think about it, a push-up is a plank. It's just plank with motion. And, um, you know, so you know, want to think about, could you do, could you do planks or whatever, or pushups, you know, as a core exercise, you absolutely could. Um, one that I like to do is a high plank and then take a, a sand, um, one of the sandbags and, you know, mm -hmm. have it weighted, put it right under, underneath your chest. You're in a high plank or basically the start of a pushup position. And then you'll take your opposite hand and you'll push it to one side and then you'll take your left hand and push it over to your, to your, um, left side. So your cross body movement um, there's a lot of different variations you can do. And again, the big thing is, is be creative, but don't overly cre make it like so challenging that your client can't do it. it. You know, again, just because it looks fun and you want to try to add new things, you want to always maintain the five kinetic chain checkpoints. Think about if the exercise is in the best interest of your client. And then at that point, you know, do, do different things. Use the kettlebells, use tubes, bands. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can do. And this is just solely just with the, with the plank um, exercise alone. So you can see we just gave you a whole bunch of different ideas that maybe you haven't really thought of before. Absolutely. And then um, next, we would like to talk about our... Um, 
Oh, that you can do more than just crunches. And <laughs> we have said this so many times because again, you know, people just assume that when you're talking about the core and unfortunately it's going to be your clients that are going to come in and say that they really want to strengthen their core. And when they think of the core, it's just the abdominal area. They really don't understand the science behind what the core is and how involved it is in every everyday movement as well as life. And so, you know, we wanted to, to think about, you know, when your clients are coming in, if they really want to do some different things, here's some more options for you. Um, yep. You know, again, you want to move in all three planes of motion. You want to add flexion and extension if they're in phase two and beyond. And then add rotation, again, phase two and beyond, because now we're thinking more global. Um, so the global muscles that we were discussing are the global stabilization system. So, uh, you know, the, the guy that has the cable and the red shorts, he's doing a, you know, anti-rotation exercise. So, again, that is more of a phase one um, or also termed as a, a hell off press. Um, you know, we've and, got. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, and it was funny. We prepping for this. I was doing lower body today. And even though it was more of a strength endurance day, as you talked about, we'll warm up with correctives and some stability just to get things moving. So I was like, I'm going to play around with this. I had never done it before. So I did the payoff press with a three, two, one reverse lunge. Oh my God. I, I was like, why did I, I'm like, why did I come up with this? Uh, but the key yeah. thing was I noticed a huge difference in my right versus left leg. So I, again, I, you know, reverse engineered it. Like, okay. Does that mean my core on one side is weaker or less stable than the other? And does that match up with my, you know, my movement compensations and is my glute not firing as well on that side? So Remember, guys, everything's an assessment. So I was like, wow. I mean, I was doing, you know, I've been doing payoff presses the last four to six weeks. And I was like, I'm dialed in. I'm like, oh, let's add a reverse lunge with it. It was brutal. And mm -hmm. then I also did it just by keeping my arms out instead of the press. And it was just, I'm like, oh, the, you know, not bring it back in was all of a sudden now, you know, my, the stabilizers in my neck and my, you know, uh, scapula was like, now was even worse because I was keeping myself in that position. So again, a lot of different cool variations you can do with something that looks so simple. Oh, absolutely. So I have, um, I have some athletes, uh, basketball players that come in and we do that. We put them on the, the we have a kinesis machine um, from Techno Gym and we have them hold it out. It's super heavy and they go into a reverse lunge to balance, having to maintain that. So, um, but again, I've worked with these people for a very long time. And so the, you know, again, you're only as creative as your, your mind will let you be, but again, they have to own the exercise. And so, um, you know, again, when people just see it, this is what they think of, but I mean, even trying to do this single leg, you have to maintain the integrity of your arch alignment and not let, let it, you know, pull you in towards the machine, um, or the, the direction of the resistance. So again, we could talk about some of these for hours. Um, and this is just one exercise. So, so I'm really glad again, that some of the questions came in and we could spend some more time on it. Um, but another exercise Marty, um, and I are going to talk to you about is just a standing cable, uh, lift. Uh, you know, you can do this kneeling, you can do it standing, you can do it single leg. Uh, that's just, I mean, lower body, uh, you know, it's an excellent exercise. And then Marty, do you want to kind of talk about a little bit more detail about it? Yeah. So kind of two rules of thumb that I go by with, if I'm going to do a rotation for stabilization, that means no movement in my spine. So I can bring my arms in patterns across my body, but I'm not allowed to move my spine. So the weight's gonna be very, very, very light. So I could do a chopping pattern or a lift pattern, but I'm gonna you know, make sure that my core is staying stable. If I get to a strength or power phase, my personal opinion is I'm always gonna clear my hip. And what I mean by that is I'm not gonna drive my leg into the ground, which would be my back leg, and then rotate with resistance and keep my foot on the ground because that torque is gonna go into the knee and the low back, hip, et cetera. So just like if I was throwing a punch in martial arts or throwing a baseball, you're gonna come off that trail leg. So those are you know, just kind of rules of thumb if you're doing any type of chopping pattern. If it's stability-based, yes, you can keep your feet where they are because you're it's very, very light and you're just trying to move around your center of gravity and not allow it to move. As you go into strength or power, if you can't clear that hip, a couple things are going on. The weight's too heavy, or you have not increased the mobility of your hip yet, which means maybe you're not ready for a strength or power phase. Fantastic. And then again, you see some of these, and, and we just pulled some that we were like, oh, this one's good. This one's good. You know, we don't talk about this often. Um, you can do a push up with a pike, just a pike. 
you can do a curl, you can do a roll out, roll in, you know, ag again, just you can see this example that, that we provided here. But, but again, you know, she's not really moving her spine, she's using a lot of hip flexor. So again, think about what it is that you're trying to work when she's using her hips to bring her or using her legs to come up. It's more of her hip flexors. However, the stabilization and the demand that she has to have to maintain that position is very core based as well. Mm -hmm. And um, Marty, is there any ad you want to add to that one particular exercise? No, I think the key thing is, you know, you should always be able to answer the question why, like, you know, Wendy and I both teach at a university and, you know, people will submit their uh, program design. And the question is, you know, design a program. And then when they give an exercise, you know, okay, why did you choose this exercise? It's not, well, because it's core day. It's, I chose a pike because they have adequate range of motion in their hips and I wanted to give them you know, a more advanced core stabilization. Why? Okay. Now there's a why don't just do it because you saw it on Instagram and someone was saying it was an amazing burn. There has to be a physiological principle that you're following based on what phase of training and what movement patterns that you feel this person needs to load appropriately. Absolutely. And you need to make sure that you have a uh... You know that you because it's you have to have a lot of stabilization in your shoulder capsule as well Absolutely. so your shoulders need to be pretty pretty dialed but yes um and then again this one's you know it's hard to tell in this picture but this is an example of just a dumbbell wood chop so they're starting more um you know kind of going high to low and you know we usually see this done on cables which they can be done on cables um again this individual is using a dumbbell just for some variety but it's the same, you know, it's just an alternate pattern. Um, we usually call these, if you're doing them um, in rehab, like D1, D2 patterns uh, for your shoulder complex. But uh, again, there is more rotational demand. Um, you can obviously see the obliques and everything having to work in the different subsystems. Um, Marty, I mean, again, I love this exercise and yeah. you can do it kneeling, standing, you know, all kinds of fun things. Yep. Um, and, and then, you know, the last one, and then I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, Marty, if you want to add anything on this. Um, but is, this is one of my favorites is just basically it's a, it's more of a power core workout um, because there is the med ball slam type, um, just basically scoop toss against a, a wall, again, a concrete wall. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, being able to, to catch. So it's basically load and unload um, that you're trying to do. And uh, very good uh, demand. You obviously want to work your way up to that because you could see the amount of force that's going to be placed on on the core in order to be able to, you know, explosively uh, throw that into the into the wall. Yep. And if you think about, you know, producing power. So going back to that dumbbell uh, lift, chop to lift or the D1, D2 pattern is. Again, you know, let's assume that he's going to get his hip all the way through and end up on his, you know, kind of plantar flex. That's triple flexion to triple extension, guys. Remember, we're teaching movement patterns. We'll call them exercises. But if you look at how athletic people, and we're all athletes, it's just to what level of an athlete produce power. It's not through their core. It's through their hip. Now, the glute is part of their core. So, yes, I'm saying that a little bit, um, you know, t deceivingly in a sense that somebody – Professional professionals say, well, Marty, they're producing it through their core because it's their glutes. Yes, but it's not the crunching motions and things like that where we've removed the glute from the exercise. They're going to be producing power in the glute, uh, in the exercise, their core base with the glute included. So whether it's the scoop toss or any of these other lifts, that's why it's so important to drive through and get that, that triple extension on the rotation. We know it's glute based. Let your client think that it's for their obliques. We could care less. It's just, are they doing it properly? And are they producing force through the right movement sequence of those muscles that get us into triple extension at the end? And that's what's most important. Absolutely. And to Marty's point, don't tell them all the muscles that they're working. No. Just say now, you know, you've had, you know, if you know that they're ready and they are in a phase five and, or they've worked their way up and you're undulating their program, you know, if they're having a crummy day, let them throw the ball. Let them think it's all ab and, and arm work, you know, because you would know, hopefully, all the muscles that it takes to, to properly do a squats, um, especially explosively. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's talk about, I think we're going to go into our resistance part next. So, um, again, we could spend so long talking about uh, each slide. It could be a webinar within itself. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit about resistance training, because as we mentioned before, every exercise that you could do has some sort of core involvement. 
Every one of them. Because again, remember, there's 29 muscles that protect the spine. And you want to make sure that you're drawn in and you're activating your glutes. You've got a neutral spine position. If you're maintaining that, those muscles are firing. And then you're adding other motions um, for prime movers uh, through your resistance training. And so, uh, you know, when we talk about the progressive warm up, there's so many different ways of thinking about this. And in previous webinars that we've done, that wasn't specifically a core webinar, we've discussed that you know, we add a little, there, there are two exercises that I do before every single phase of training. And again, you know, a little bit different than, than you might read about, but it's because there is a purpose for it. And there's specific, more activation muscles that are more kind of corrective exercise based. And those to me are, have, I have my clients do lateral tube walking is really trying to get some glute meat activation and then I have them do ball bridges because I want full glute activation before I get them into whatever phase. And, um, you know, those are two specific exercises, A, that, you know, you could say are, are more activation exercises, but they're very core based. And um, when done correctly, they are very specific um, to uh, pinpoint muscles that, that I really want to fire throughout their workout. Mm hmm and then Marty, and what did you want to add? Kind of my go-tos is everything you said. I mean, you know, sometimes I'll change them up based on where I'm working out because I do a lot of traveling for this. So sometimes my environment is a little unique and different, but similar. You know, there'll always be that after my, you know, proper uh, mobility between the foam roll and the right stretching, which, you know, I have to do a lot of and to get to where I need to be. There's always that core activation, but I always try to do, even if I'm doing a strength or power day, I always try to do something on a single leg towards the end, just again, to kind of, you know, cause I might be in that phase for four to six or eight weeks. So yeah, I'm going to do some of that in my warm up. but I under fatigue, I still like to challenge myself neuromuscularly because I never want to lose that ability to stabilize and get my core involved. So I could finish with a ton of different exercises. And Wendy, you and I were talking today. Today was a strength endurance day for I did lower body and then biceps, again, a core as well. So my finishing exercise today was single leg bicep curls alternating. And again, it wasn't about me thinking about the bicep part. I could, I could do elbow flexion in my sleep. The whole focus was keep that chin tucked. Don't let the head come forward. Keep your shoulders back. Don't hips, you know, waver. Draw that belly button and make sure you're breathing. Arch neutral. It had nothing to do with the elbow flexion part. All I do when I'm thinking about that is go, the slower I go, the better. And I, what I'll do is I'll stand in front of the clock and be like, okay, I'm doing 12 reps. It better take at least 45 seconds, you know, or more. So, and Marty, you were doing this on a TRX, correct? No, this was a single leg. Okay. Um, standing dumbbell curls. Oh, standing. Okay. Okay. Yep. So again, but that's, again, I will, regardless of the phase of training by and large, I usually do some type of finishing exercise because I know that I had to work really, really hard to get my ankle mobility and my hip mobility. And now I want to maintain that stability and core stability. So I'll always put something like that in if I, you know, if I'm not overtraining towards the end of my workout when I'm fatigued, because I really want to challenge this stability in a fatigue state, even when I've done the other phases of training. That's just the way I like to kind of have an ending type of, uh, to my workout. So Marty, can I ask you, um, cause I know that you're, you're awesome explaining this. I've heard you, you, you go off, um, on a work, on a workshop before an in, a, in a very, in a very positive way. And yeah. I think it can be very beneficial, but you know, so, you know, we often do, you know, we think about the neural continuum and when we talk about the neural continuum, we obviously talk if it's upper body that you're going to start with two arms go into alternating arms um, in different directions, single arm and then single arm with rotation. And then, then on the lower body, again, it would be two legs, staggered stance, single leg, you know, single leg with, you know, whatever. So, um, and then we can combine the two. So with that in mind, um, can you ex discuss, like when you're doing a chest press on the ball mm -hmm. and you had someone do a single arm chest press and then you did a single arm chest press with rotation, just the demand that is on the core throughout and, and how beneficial that can be even without the rotation, but just the sure. single arm. Yeah. So when we're doing like w Wendy did look for a picture of that single arm dumbbell chest press on a ball and just couldn't find it. So, you know, well, if I you could find it. It's not in the right form. So yes. not one that I would have find it, find it to our level, <laughs> find it to our level. Right. So when you look at what that gentleman is doing, imagine just now taking out the, the bench for a ball. If we're using a stability ball automatically, that's telling you that's not a strength based exercise. So really when you think about it, I'm doing a, um, unilateral pushing exercise in an unstable core environment. 
I could care less about the push again. Now, I'm not saying if the form and technique of the push is bad. Just like today, I wasn't too focused on my bicep curl, meaning that that is the easiest part to control. Because I wouldn't put myself or somebody else in a situation where if they can't do the one arm, that I'm worried about their form and technique. And that's my, on me, not the individual doing the exercise. So they might think it's a core, uh, I'm sorry, they might think it's a, a chest exercise or this, that, the other. And I could talk about, hey, let's see if you can produce the same amount of force one arm versus the other instead of both, whatever I need to do to talk them through it. But what I'm really focusing on is can I, kind of like a payoff rest, is can I keep myself rigid and stable? Now, when I say rigid, I'm not talking about bracing and not breathing properly. I'm talking about not moving off of my neutral position as I'm doing things that create a ton of demand on one side of the body versus the other. So that's why I love single arm exercises like that. Again, you know, at the, at the right point in time. But I also, myself, for me, I also like to put some of these in, 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 in a fatigued state at the end of a workout with the parameters that the load is never going to be inappropriate. It's just what is, I use the term, what's my exit strategy is if the exercise is going bad, it's not going to be too much weight that comes crashing down. It's if I neuromuscularly, I'm like, you know what, I can't control this today. I have an easy exit strategy. Now the exit strategy could be a regression, or it could be that, you know, today I need to find a, maybe I do it standing or this, that, the other, but really being able to challenge that central nervous system to do things on one side of my body versus the other. Cause if we go back to my payoff press table, the first lunge, I identified a weakness that I thought maybe I had fixed. I had fixed it in a more controlled environment. I had fixed it on two legs, but it still showed up a little bit when I started to go through that neural continuum. So it's a great way to bring in cool, fun exercises, but it's also a great way to say, wait a minute, we found a new level of weakness. That's not a bad thing. It's just we handled it level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, Oop, level six. That's where we're rubber meets the road where, OK, this is where we're currently, you know, need to now push through to get to that next level of progression. So. You know, and it could be the upper extremity could be, you know, the issue, the lower extremity or both. And it could switch one side of the body versus the other because that's not uncommon the way the body is wired for movement, depending on your previous sports and your previous activities and or previous injuries. So, Wendy, I hope I answered that the way you were looking or you could ask a follow up. I, I, if I told y'all like I, that was perfect. <laughs> Uh, we could probably continue to keep going on and on too, but uh, I know Greg is probably like, okay, look at the time. So, um, so Marty, before we move on um, from from this slide, if you had to name your top two resistance exercises that you love to do, that have the little twist in there, what are they? Sure. For me personally, uh, again, going back to my earliest days of falling in, in love with NASM and the model and understanding what the way my body worked is, I've got two major compensations I'm all working towards. Never perfected them improve them dramatically is my foot and ankle. Even when I was going back to when I was eight, nine years old, I was told I had flat feet, didn't really have flat feet. I just everted, and I've always struggled maintaining that neutral arch. So I'm gonna always do something on a single leg, usually one arm or alternating because that forces the core activation as well. And I want that core activation from the ground up because most of my day I'm standing up. I, I love to doing the ground-based exercises too. So I have kind of like one or two, depending on what type of workout I'm doing. So today I, I already explained. Uh, so when I go in the gym tomorrow, it's more of a push pull pattern. So what I'll do tomorrow is it's strength endurance. So on my endurance, I'm going to do a single leg bent over alternating row for my stabilization. And it's miserable. I go do my six or eight pull-ups or my heavy rows. It's brutal because my foot, ankle and core, I feel that all those I know my body wanted to fall out of that position. So those are kind of how I think about it. I need some variety. So I usually have a way to come up with something like that for each uh, day that I'm training. Nice. All right. And then, uh, Greg, I don't know if we had any, any questions that came up. Well, first off, I was not looking at the clock. I always enjoy the conversations <laughs> you both have. So, oh, so uh, don't be telling the audience uh, otherwise. Oh, so, in a loving way. Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> oh, always. Uh, uh, we have a question from Paul uh, in the chat going back to the plank section. He was wondering, should the shoulders be protracted uh, in, in that plank situation? 
So, so when we talked about the plank, we, we said there's like a little plus. So, so you want to think that you don't want to be, you just, you want to be, be able to add that plus. Yes. You want to kind of think that you're, you're digging your arms in. you like how I'm trying to demonstrate it, <laughs> digging your arms into the ground. Um, so that will help the shoulder blades lie flat onto the back. Now, again, if they are super weak in their serratus anterior, you're going to see their shoulder blades kind of wing up and no matter how hard you protract or you really depress into the floor to really try to get those to lay flat, they just won't because it will take some time to really, um, to start to build strength. So therefore they do lay flat on the shoulder or on the rib cage, like they're meant to. Um, so, so yes, think about kind of pushing down into protraction. Just make sure that you've got really good alignment in your, in your head and neck, as well as making sure that you keep that neutral spine. Out. If not, uh, you're going into spinal flexion and that's definitely something that you don't want. And then uh, we had Emily in the chat who wants to know, how do you draw in the belly but still breathe from your dry diaphragm? Do you just keep things tight but let your abs move? <laughs> Marty, that's all you. <laughs> gotcha. So when we're bringing, uh, first of all, let's find neutral spine. So again, you know, like, like Wendy was just demonstrating, here I am, not that you can see, but I'm you know, going from anterior to posterior. So you find neutral. And then you just draw your belly button in a little bit to, as you're doing, like if uh, and it's a brace. So now from there, from neutral with that belly button drawn in slightly, then as I go breathe, I should allow me to tune up kind of like the billows. And then I pull it in a little further to exhale. So I understand that it is a different concept because everyone's just draw in, but that's where you kind of see everyone's stomach and diaphragm elevate so again it's it's minor and i think sometimes people try to draw in too much it's not drawing in as far as you can go it's just drawing in a tiny little bit so again if i'm exhaling and allowing my stomach to expand in neutral and then as i exhale draw back in that's the way to do it so it's, it's going to take some practice for sure and, and another thing, too, is you're going to notice if you do it correctly, your chest shouldn't really move. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was the hardest thing for me to learn. Um, I would have to put my hand on my stomach. And then, you know, we, we would say this oftentimes in our workshop, you know, act like you're not married and stick it out as far as you can and married, suck it in as hard as you can and try <laughs> to find that even place. So do the married, not married, married, not married and get used to moving your stomach without moving your chest along with it. And then at that point, when you find the middle ground, um, or your happy place, then at that point, like add the little bit of drawing in that Marty said. And, uh, and it just takes a lot of practice. It really did take me a long time to learn how to breathe correctly, because even though I was working out, breathing out, when I would come like into a crunch, I would breathe in and I would breathe out. I still was breathing from my chest and not my stomach. And it was, mm -hmm. it, it did take a long time for me to learn to do it correctly. I'm perpetually stuck in the married phase. So <laughs> I, I am there. too, but you know what I mean? Like <laughs> you've seen those commercials, you know? <laughs> um, well, that, uh, so that is, uh, that is it for the, for the questions, but uh, thank you guys awesome. uh, again. Uh, and if, everybody watching a uh, fantastic active chat today. And uh, don't forget if you're interested in uh, learning more about the corrective exercise specialization as well, links in the bio or links in the post, you Great. can check it out there. All right. Well, thanks guys. Awesome. Thank you everybody.